And interestingly, and this is really comes out in my next book, The Last Best Cure, is that it really looks as if it's also linked to how we manufacture stress chemicals in the body. It's a whole other topic that's not in this book, but it looks as if when women are stressed, we produce a higher level of cytokine activity and stress hormones that help to whip up the immune system into unhealthy responses. So that may be where we're going. The science isn't in yet, but that does look like where it's going. In the meantime, what we understand, I don't think there's, you'd have to be under a rock for the last five years not to have heard the words endocrine disruptors. So endocrine disruptors are really interesting. Let's say we're in a radio station and I'm sending out a frequency from my radio station and I'm also receiving frequencies into my radio station so I can, you know, play this show. So with endocrine disruptors, what happens is that something that's artificial, that's in the bloodstream, it could come from a chemical like PCPs, it could come from plastic additives such as BPA, and and really a huge exposure is common pesticides. So these break down in our bloodstream, they look, they mimic, they look a lot like an endocrine disruptor. I mean, they look a lot like an endocrine a hormone. They look a lot like these secretions. And what happens is that they begin to occupy special receptors that are made to receive real estrogen hormone on the cells of various organs in our bodies. And this is a real problem because then what happens is that we begin to screw up that radio signal. If that radio signal is being sent out from the station or receptor, then, and, and suddenly that little receptor is taken up by something artificial, we're only really beginning to understand what that means for disease in the body. And that's why you're starting to see a lot of research on endocrine disruptors and diabetes, endocrine disruptors and obesity, endocrine disruptors and every kind of disease that we can think of because we are blocking our natural estrogen hormone signals. They can't send out any signal at all, or they send it out and it's one way, or it's blocked because something else is sitting in that parking spot. We don't get it yet completely how dangerous this is going to be for human health, but we do believe it plays a role in autoimmune disease And it may well play a role in why autoimmune disease is more prevalent for women. The pieces of the puzzle aren't together, but we're not really that far from putting them together. You know, we just figured out in the last 10 to 15 years that you need more natural progesterone in the body than estrogen once you're perimenopause and menopausal. In complementary and integrative medicine, that's already clear and there's evidence for that. So I can just imagine when you bring in environmental toxins and pesticides and cosmetic input on the skin and a lot of the things that we use on our skin, which is the biggest organ of the body, plus what we're breathing in the air. If we're not chelating in any way, if we're not doing prevention, what must be happening with these endocrine disruptors being turned on us, so to speak? But I wanted you also to share a little bit about the Buffalo, New York hazardous waste site as just an example of the 1,200 sites that have yet to be cleaned up. This is not to go into a negative spin about anything, but there was many profound things you said in the book. But one of them really struck me, which said you can eat the best foods, take the best vitamins, take care of yourself and exercise, and you can drink pure water and you can do all of these things that are proactive. But sorry, folks, if you're near one of these hazardous waste sites, you didn't say it in this way, but basically it may nullify everything you're doing to take care of yourself. Do you know what I'm saying? Yep. I do know what you're saying. And so let me give you an image that I use throughout the book, and you'll be familiar with it, um, having just read it. And I call it the barrel effect. And so we all have, we're all, you can, you can see, I use a lot of analogies. Yeah, writers, that's a great analogy, yeah, by the way. We, we do it because we're trying to bridge the scientists that we, we work with and, and interview and follow around in their labs with people who want to really understand this information, but a lot of us can understand it better if we have an image to hang on to. I certainly know that I can. 
So in the barrel effect, what I call throughout the book the barrel effect, we're all like the proverbial barrel. We've all seen that moment where you have water rise and rise and rise, whether it's in a cup or a pail or a barrel, and it gets all the way up to the top, and it's still in a state of homeostasis. Nothing has spilled over. But you can do this experiment with kids, and I think most kids go through it in grade school, where you add that last drop, just one more, and the water spills. It begins to spill, not that one drop, but much more than it. And in that, in that, in, in that analogy, our immune systems are somewhat similar. Um, we can walk down the street eating a sandwich made with Velveeta cheese, which no offense to Velveeta, but it's really, you know, it's not, it's not healthy food. It's processed chemical food with artificial colors, artificial flavorings, artificial everything. Well, our body doesn't really recognize those artificial foods, and it goes, okay, is this an invader? Is this an invader? Is this an invader? Usually we can handle that. Our immune system can figure out, well, it is different. It's not something that... I recognize from my evolutionary biology, but okay, I'll let it pass. A block later, we walk by a guy who's spraying the rose bushes, and he's spraying it with a a type of pesticide, which is an endocrine disruptor, and we take a full whiff of it before we realize what's happening. And now our immune system is going, okay, Velveeta cheese, you know, pesticides, what is all this stuff entering, entering, entering? And, and then we pull out our sunscreen or our cosmetic block or whatever. We're deciding, you know, we're heading to the beach on our little walk with our Velveeta cheese sandwich. And so we rub it all over our face and it's got all kinds of things in it, which are also bad for the body and endocrine disruptors, or many cosmetics have things in them which are not good for us. So we're going down the street, and now by the time we get to the beach, our immune system is buzzing. It's going, whoa, you know, fight this, don't fight that, fight this, don't fight that. All of a sudden, the war is bigger, it's more complicated, and they're more likely to make mistakes. Our immune system is more likely to make mistakes because we really outpaced our evolutionary ability to keep up with all the things that we're being exposed to, whether it's through the air we breathe, the things we touch, the stuff we put in our mouth, or any other entry into our body. So having said that, if all those exposures were drops of water in the barrel, the barrel spilling over. If you live near a toxic waste site, we don't have statistics on this, but let's say you're starting with your barrel half full. So all the other exposures you're going to get through the day that many of us get, we pick up our dry cleaning, we've got trichloroethylene in our dry cleaning, we've got um, the stuff in our face cream, all day long, we use super glue and we've got some exposures to different agents there that are related to autoimmune disease. We decide to use some turpentine to work on something in the garage. Well, there's another exposure related to autoimmune disease. If we also live near a toxic waste site in close proximity, wow, that barrel is just so much more likely to be literally pouring water over. And so what I suggest people do, because we do have a lot of super fun sites that were never cleaned up, is that they look into, you know, the area in which they live. And there are ways to do that. Um, I spent a lot of time up in Buffalo, New York, a particular neighborhood, which has a strikingly high rate of lupus. These are the nicest people in the world living in a community near several super fun sites. And the rate of lupus is so high that the local universities have multiple outreach programs going into the community. If you drive through this area of Buffalo, you will see signs that say, know someone with lupus, bring them in. How, you know, that's kind of scary that where you live is going to define the billboards in your neighborhood about your disease prevalence because of your address. I love that you put also links to how people can find out how many toxic waste sites are near their area. Right. Yeah. I think everybody kind of wants to have heard from a lot of people. And, and I have a real um, connection to Buffalo at this point. I've gone up there quite a bit to do... Um, different um, events in that neighborhood and, and have been able to bring a lot of attention to that neighborhood. And 
it just it's heartbreaking.